Hello, and welcome back to Management 201, Introduction to Professional Management. Today, we're going to talk about communication and information technology. This is not a lecture on IT or any of the databases or anything like that, but we'll mention those systems uh, when such mentions are warranted. Primarily, it is a lecture about uh, communication between people and barriers to communication and what you can do as a manager to start uh, to structure communications in your company effectively. So uh, let me pull up my slides. Here we are. Uh, we're gonna cover a number of topics. Uh, so we'll start with um, organizational communication in general and the kind of communications you might expect to have in your company when you join one. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, information technology, information systems and networks, and how they facilitate decision-making in companies and how they facilitate communication between individuals. And then we're going to switch gears and talk about interpersonal communication process and communication barriers, message transmission channels, which ones to use and what effect it has uh, on understanding that people derive uh, from such communication. Uh, how to send messages correctly and how to receive messages effectively. Responding to messages, dealing with criticism, so that kind of stuff. First of all, organizational communication. Um, there are two big groups, uh, two big classes of communications that happen within companies, formal communication and informal communication. Formal communication basically refers to all communication that is officially sanctioned by the organization. So when your manager tells you to do something, that would be an example of a vertical communication. When your peers discuss something work-related, right? So if you work in a marketing department and uh, you, know, you and your peers have the same hierarchical position within the company, and you discuss something that uh, has to do maybe with the launch of a new product or a particular marketing campaign, that would be an example of a horizontal communication. So horizontal communications, uh, they happen at the same level, so we do not really distinguish between them any further. With vertical communication, they can be of two types, uh, downward and upward. Downward, obviously, is a communication from the boss to the employees, to subordinates, and uh, upward vertical communication is communication that happens from bottom up, right? So here, subordinates will take some, uh, tell something to their superiors, um, and again, all of that uh, has to be work-related. Informal communication is something that is not technically sanctioned by the company. We all develop friendships uh, as we start spending time with other people. And uh, you can find yourself, if you're in the marketing department, uh, you know, having a nice chat with someone from finance on something completely unrelated to your work, right? You may discuss a, a football match, uh, you may discuss movies, you may talk about the kids, or any plans for the weekend. So those kind of communications are informal. They are also known as grapevine communication. And uh, sometimes uh, they are a lot more effective in spreading the information throughout the company, something that you would never get exposed to through formal channels you can actually pick up quite easily through your informal lines of communication with, uh, with colleagues. Um, obviously, communication involves some information uh, and uh, there's an important distinction between data, information, and big data that I would like to uh, introduce to you right now. When we talk about data, it's basically unorganized facts and figures. So uh, as soon as you try to convert it into a form that helps people make decisions and do their job, the data is transformed into information. And to be useful, information has to be timely, relevant, and understandable. Notice uh, it doesn't really tell about the information being engaging. It's not about how fun the information is, but it has to be relevant, it has to be in a form that facilitates understanding so that you can act on information. And it has to be timely so that uh, if there's something that needs to be done, you have the time to do it. And finally, big data. This is something that's been talked about a lot over the past few years. 
So here we talk about very large data sets uh, that are used to run statistical analysis to find relationship between variables and predict outcomes. So here we really talk about the importance of statistics and econometrics, and uh, this is very important for policy development. So uh, whenever governments uh, try to maybe change some institutional environment or they, they try to calculate how different policies would affect the individuals, uh, those decisions should better be based on uh, sound statistical analysis of all the information, all the data, the big data that they can get. And uh, that's a big part of the academic community as well. A lot of what we do entails uh, collecting the information on thousands of companies over many years and trying to find some statistical relationship between the variables so that we can give some advice to the decision makers at uh, different companies as to the kind of strategies that lead to outcomes that they desire. Obviously, big companies do that as well. Companies like Amazon and Walmart, they track the information, they analyze big data to be able to identify the trends that will have implications for the bottom line. So that's, that's the big data. And uh, with respect to information technology, Right, so obviously a lot of our interaction with data and information has to be facilitated by the proper technology. So in the most general sense, uh, when we talk about information technology, it's any kind of technology, be that hardware, software, or operating systems that we use to store, process, and distribute useful data and information. That includes the internet, the Internet of Things, which is a relatively recent phenomenon, electronic commerce, be that uh, business to business, business to employee, business to cons uh, consumers, peer to peer, consumer to consumer, all sorts of interactions could be facilitated um, through electronic commerce. Wireless communication, the so-called M commerce, M stands for mobile, and cloud com computing. So those are the things, the different uh, kinds of information technologies that businesses uh, typically engage uh, when they interact with their customers and, and whatever agencies they need to interact with. And uh, they also engage various information systems in their activities, day-to-day -day activities that come in three basic forms. The simplest one is the so-called transaction process and systems. This is something that's used for routine and recurrent business matters, right? So there is no sophistication there per se. We also have management information systems uh, that are used to help make routine business decisions. They are really good at organizing information and presenting relevant information to the decision makers in real time. And then finally, for non-routine decisions, we use decision support systems. So obviously, as you go along this continuum, system become more and more sophisticated. Um, there's a lot of training required. They are kind of expensive, so depending on what kind of business you're in, uh, you may not have a justifiable need to, to invest in one of those, but uh, if you work for a major company where there's a lot of non-routine decisions, then you probably want to consider investing in one of those more sophisticated systems. And now back to interpersonal communication. Right, so we talked before about there being formal and informal communication and those different levels at which it occurs, the communication process itself is quite simple. First of all, it includes two or more individuals, one of whom would be the sender of information and the other one or other ones would be the receivers. And uh, obviously in the communication process, the sender and receiver roles uh, would change as people communicate. As a sender, what you do is, uh, well, obviously, it's a good idea to know what you want to say before you say it or before you send that information to others. So uh, you encode the message and select the transmission channel. And we'll talk about transmission channels uh, in a second. So then you transmit that message 
through the channel where the receiver receives it, decodes the message, and decides whether or not the feedback is needed. If the feedback is needed or some sort of response, or maybe if the receiver now wants to send you a message, then um, the same thing happens effectively, right? So uh, the feedback response or new message may be transmitted through a channel using much the same approach, right? When the receiver would encode his own message and send it through one of the channels. Uh, so obviously the sender and the receiver continually change the roles as they communicate. And uh, when we talk about channels, we may talk about oral communication, written communication, nonverbal communication. So again, we'll unpack that as we go along. The problem is um, very often communication is rather ineffective because there are some barriers to the communication process. One is perception. Right? We all have our frame of reference and uh, even though we may hear the words that are being sent our way, we may interpret them differently, right? We, our, our reference point is different. Uh, we may filter out some of the information. We may retain the information that uh, maybe is favorable to us uh, and we block the information that is unfavorable. So uh, in, in any given communication, a substantial chunk of it may get lost. Then there's also information overload. Uh, right now we have we are bombarded with information coming from um, you know all sorts of media at us all the time and uh, we have our cognitive limitations right so we may actually be quite, quite tired and incapable of uh, receiving more. So that is uh, an important limitation to how effective your communication might be. Channel selection. The sender may choose the wrong channel to send the information. If someone needs to present you with uh, a lot of numbers, then maybe oral communication is not the way to do it. Right? So when you need to, trans to, to, to send the information that has maybe you know, some budget projections, uh, tax information, anything that has a lot of numbers, some channels would be better than others, right? And when you try to, on the other hand, send some marketing message where you have to inspire people to try certain things, then maybe written communication is not necessarily the proper channel. So you have to tailor the message to the channel. There may be noise uh, in your channels. Uh, you know, as, as you communicate with someone, you may have text messages coming into your smartphone, which will compete for your attention. And if there's a lot of those distractions, again, the quality of the communication will be uh, diminished. So you've got to do something about it. Trust and credibility. Receiving the same kind of information from two different individuals may have a very different impact on you as a receiver. If you trust the person, if you respect the person who is telling you something, if you know the person to be an expert, you will definitely pay a lot of attention to what's being said and your behavior will change in response to that communication. If that same information comes from someone else, someone who you do not necessarily respect in a professional capacity, then you would be a lot less likely to do much based on the information received. You know, uh, think about hearing the same message from your parents hundred times over who want you to do something or who want you to stop doing something and you just ignore it, not because you necessarily don't respect them, but because this is how, you know, the, the communication relation in the family is. You hear that same message from your boss at your company, or maybe from some of your peers who you've seen being successful, and that's a very different story, right? So uh, your, your relationship with the person who sends you the message determines to a substantial extent whether or not you will receive it and act on it as intended. You may just be a poor listener, 
right? So maybe, maybe you're not listening to the person, maybe your mind wanders off somewhere else, and that may be a, a problem, that may be a barrier to communication. Your emotions may get in the way, and um, again, if you're all, I don't know, positive or negative, or you're agitated, Again, a lot of the information may be filtered out and you may respond to some cues that you would otherwise ignore and you know, do something that you shouldn't do. So that's important. Filtering, again, we talked about that. And uh, language and culture, right? So uh, language, you guys are listening to this lecture from me and this is my second language. So it's quite possible that some things do not translate the way that I intend them. Right, there's an accent, there's a uh, translation itself. So uh, maybe some of it gets lost in a post of communication. Culturally, you know, depending on who you interact with, some cultures are more direct and contradicting the presenter, the sender of the information. Some cultures use very roundabout ways of delivering the message. If you don't know what to expect from that specific culture, then you may misinterpret the message and act erroneously based on your beliefs. So understanding cultures, being culturally aware um, is, is absolutely essential. Now to the channels. So we primarily talk about three groups of uh, message transmission channels, oral communication, nonverbal communication, and written communication. And oral um, is by far the best for delivering most messages. It's definitely the richest one. So that includes face-to-face -face conversations, meetings, presentations, phone conversations, voicemail messages. In addition to the words themselves, you get to see, you know, to hear the, the tone of voice, maybe emotions. Um, it's easier if it's face-to-face -face or maybe, you know, online Zoom. It's easy to see what the person feels about that information, right? What he thinks about the information that, that you know, he or she tries to transmit. So um, for that reason, oral communication is, is very rich and is preferred in many cases. With nonverbal communication, that includes things like the set in itself, right? So when, uh, when now I, you know, teach from home, I have to find a corner of the house that would not really distract you from, from the message itself. It has to look professional enough. Uh, it, you know, I try my best to avoid some noises that shouldn't be here. And so I have to talk to my family members that I'm not disrupted or interrupted when I'm recording the lecture. So the setting itself is essential. Body language uh, also communicates a lot, right? You get to see whether or not the person means what he or she says, um, whether or not the person is excited about the product, if we talk about you know, a salesperson trying to sell you the product. You look at facial expressions, vocal quality, gestures, postures, and you know sometimes you have some supporting materials like posters, right, so pictures that do not necessarily communicate in words, but they help uh, reinforce the message. And then finally, written communication. So that would be things like your emails or texts, memos, letters, reports, faxes, bulletin boards, posters, when they have the words, and newsletters. And the general trend is uh, that the quality of writing actually goes down substantially. And um, I cannot emphasize it more. Uh, you guys really need to pay attention to your writing. So many classes do not necessarily penalize uh, the students for their quality of writing. My class being one of those, right? So I do not necessarily grade best based on grammar. But for your own professional success. It is absolutely essential that your writing is impeccable, uh, succinct, uh, that you get the message across. So I know that you guys are supposed to take business communication class. Um, please pay attention. Right? This is very important, very essential, and it will really serve you well if you master it. 
with respect to sending messages, um, depending on you know how often you communicate with a specific person with whom you uh, to whom you're about to send the message, you may need to invest some effort uh, in developing rapport before sending the message as such. If it's a person with whom you have regular communication, then supposedly the rapport is already there, so you don't really need to spend time doing that. Um, and you may go to the next step, which is you have to state your communication objective. Like for me personally, when I receive a message from the dean's secretary saying that, hey, the dean wants to see you, I don't like those emails. Right, so I want to know why he wants to see me and whether or not I did something that I wasn't supposed to, whether or not I'm in trouble. Right, so the message has to, to state the communication objective. That makes it a lot more professional and it's much, much easier than to plan and prepare for the meeting. So then once you've stated your objective, you transmit the message and it's absolutely essential for you to check the receiver's understanding. So you may ask follow-up questions, uh, you may see if the receiver sent you some feedback that shows that actually, you know, the message has been received properly. And then you get a commitment from that person and you follow up, right? So as a uh, sender of the message, it is up to you to secure commitment from the receiver and then to follow up to make sure that what has been promised has been delivered. So that is essential. Uh, you want to uh, always check the understanding of that other person with feedback. So you have to be open to feedback, obviously. And sometimes it means that, um, you know, you receive the feedback that you're not happy about. So it may require some back and forth to make sure that uh, communication is effective. You have to be aware of nonverbal communication. So you have to check you know, facial expressions and posture and things of that nature, which is where cultural awareness comes in really handy because depending on who you communicate with, the person may not behave like you'd expect. Again, this is something that I told you early on in the semester. Like for us, I come from Russia. We are taught from the very young age to not smile unless there is a real good reason. So, uh, you know, if uh, you tell me something and you don't see me smile back, it doesn't actually mean that, you know, what you say is wrong or that you're in trouble. It's just me falling back on my upbringing, me displaying the kind of behavior that I was taught. So uh, you have to be aware of nonverbal communication, but you also have to place it in context what it means for that specific person. Um, as a receiver of the information, you want to ask questions, make sure that you've understood everything correctly, and a very effective technique is paraphrasing. So if you paraphrase the message and send it back to the original sender, and that sender confirms that this is indeed what he or she intended to send, that's the best way to ensure that you are on the same page. So that's, that's essential. Um, as a message receiver, you definitely want to listen very carefully, pay attention, avoid distractions, you know, don't check your cell phone or something like that. Don't assume and interrupt. So wait until the message is over to, to actually make something out of it. You want to watch for the nonverbal behavior because sometimes uh, you know there's more to the message than being transformed, tra sent to you uh, through the oral communication uh, as such. Ask questions, take notes when appropriate, and convey understanding. Right? If you really do understand and convey it to the sender, it will make the whole communication process. Um, more enjoyable, I guess, to all parties and will help you avoid some repetitions. Then once you've listened to the message, you have to analyze it. So you want to think about it, but you wait to evaluate until after listening. You don't want to act based on half the information. You don't necessarily want to act based on your assumptions. So you want to make sure you received all the message, 
you, you paraphrased it, you made sure that you understood everything correctly, and then you start thinking what to do about it. Again, how you check uh, understanding by paraphrasing and watching nonverbal behavior. In terms of responding to messages, uh, there are five basic categories of response, and some of them are more or less appropriate depending on the situation. So, uh, you know, like advising. Obviously, you know, you don't want to advise other people what to do unless you've been asked for advice, right? So you keep your advice to yourself unless you're asked. Sometimes uh, you need to reassure other people, right? So reassuring is appropriate when the speaker's confidence needs a boost. Again, for those of us who are parents, uh, well, we know how easy it is to reassure your kid and, uh, you know, then all sorts of miracles might happen. When a person believes in himself or herself, they can do wonders. Sometimes you need to reflect, right? So when you reflect on, on, on the message that uh, you receive, that will be appropriate when you try to coach another person or counsel another person. So here you provide different angles on the situation and uh, you know, you make sure that you understand the situation correctly, but then this same reflection by you on the message that is transmitted to you by the sender may open up the eyes for the sender as well. So it's really good when coaching or counseling and maybe when you're providing some developmental feedback to your employees, that, that is a good one to use. If you're not sure whether or not you understood the message correctly, then the most appropriate response type is probing. So you ask more questions. It could be something as simple as asking just, you know, how come, or what do you mean? Or it can be more involved when you try again to, to flesh out the issue from multiple angles and ask the questions uh, towards that end. And finally, if the conversation is such that uh, either person is uncomfortable, the most appropriate style, uh, response style is diverting. So you actually, you change the, the subject of communication. You don't necessarily funnel this potentially problematic topic to avoid some drama, right? So depending on what the nature of the situation is, the kind of response that you provide uh, should differ. You also probably heard a lot about emotional intelligence. So this is the topic that has come to the fore, I would say in the late 90s. Um, and uh, there's this whole school of thought uh, out in uh, Ohio, specifically Case Western Reserve University, several researchers that work really hard uh, developing this notion of emotional intelligence. And uh, basically what it says is that uh, you can increase your own effectiveness if you develop your emotional intelligence. And that includes five specific categories. First of all, self-awareness. You have to be aware of your own shortcomings as well as your strengths, right? So you have to, by knowing your own limitations, you can increase the effectiveness of your communication. Self-management is another one. So uh, you have to manage yourself appropriately, which means that, you know, that, that will increase the effectiveness of your listening. And, uh, you know, maybe you refrain from uh, engaging in certain activities in response to what you've heard. So that will increase the effectiveness of communication. Self-motivation, empathy, and social skills. Right, so those are the five components that make up emotional intelligence and it's definitely very useful. Um, if you have it, it will make you a great communicator and increase your success um, throughout different facets of the organizational life. And final criticism. And so a big part of uh, communication is uh, given or receiving criticism. And how we deal with that is essential for our success as managers, as individuals, as employees, or as employers. So how do we deal with that? 
First of all, when given criticism, you want to state specific behavior that can be improved, right? You do not criticize the person, you criticize the behavior. You explain what has been done wrong and what should be done about it. Uh, second thing, you specify the improved behavior. So it's not enough to say that this is wrong, don't do it. You have to explain what and how should be done instead. Sometimes you need to teach the person to do it. And this is why you know, professional development is, is so important. And um, that is not necessarily a fast process, right? dealing with some things that are not done the way they should be done. But if you want your organization to be run effectively, it absolutely has to be done in this manner. Um, it is also helpful if you can get this other person to ask for criticism. It's kind of like with advice, right? Unless you ask for advice, you don't want to give it. With criticism, sometimes as manager, you don't really have any other choice but to criticize people, but you will be heard much better if that other person asks for criticism first. How you do that is an open question. So uh, maybe you tell some motivational stories about employees who have asked for criticism previously or you don't even have call it criticism, right? So you would call it feedback or something. And you know what great outcomes that had. But you basically want to invest in developing the trust and relationship with your employee where they can ask you for criticism and actually to take it seriously and act on it. Another funny thing is criticizing the boss. Sometimes it's absolutely necessary, but uh, it's a hard thing to do, right? This is something that most of us would want to avoid and you have to definitely exercise caution when criticizing your superiors. So you definitely want to frame your criticism uh, in a certain way. Uh, you definitely still want to give praise for something that's been done correctly and maybe frame it as suggestions or, or use something that the boss has done previously to say that, you know, like, as you said before, I was thinking about it and uh, you were right. That's a better way of doing that. So you kind of, well, you kind of have to suck it up a bit if you want your own criticism uh, towards your boss to be heard and acted upon. And when you are the one receiving criticism, it could be painful, but remember, no pain, no gain, right? So uh, you want to make the most out of it and um, just see it as an opportunity to improve, to improve your understanding, to improve your performance, and ultimately to improve your life. If you do that, you're going to be fine. And um, that basically covers uh, this, uh, this week's uh, lecture. So uh, the quiz should be up uh, on D2L. Please take it and uh, best of luck. I'll see you next week.